You know the songs, but do you know their history? <laughs> Join us for an in-depth look at the stories behind the biggest songs in the world. This is Encore. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah. The stories behind the songs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's iHeartRadio's Miles Galloway. Welcome to or welcome back to another episode of Encore with me, Miles Galloway. Stories behind some of the biggest ever, like ever, songs. Sorry. Here's the story of Taylor Swift's We Are Never, Ever Getting Back Together. In 2012, Taylor Swift was one of the biggest country music stars in the world. She was also one of the biggest pop stars in the world too. And like her hero Shania Twain before her, Taylor was able to walk a tightrope between the two genres, something that many artists had failed to do. But many fans and critics felt it was just a matter of time before Taylor made the switch to full-on pop star, leaving country behind her. Taylor always seemed to have her eyes set on becoming a pop star, despite being one of country music's most recognizable names. Her 2008 single Love Story was the first country song to top Billboard's pop chart in the charts 16 years. And while country music has also had its place at the Grammys, Taylor shocked the world by winning Album of the Year for Fearless, an honor generally reserved for more established, less country-leaning artists. But I don't think anyone will ever forget what happened at the 2009 MTV Video Music Awards. Just as Taylor was accepting the award for Best Female Video, Kanye West spoiled the moment by upstaging her. Yo, Taylor. I I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. One of the best videos of all time. Just like that, Kanye became public enemy number one, and Taylor was deemed America's sweetheart. By the time she released her next album in 2010, Taylor Swift was well on her way to becoming a pop star, first and foremost. Taylor Swift's third album, Speak Now, was a phenomenal success when it was released in November 2010, selling more copies in its first week than any country artist ever. More than anything, Taylor showed greater maturity as a songwriter, giving a more adult perspective on love through themes of heartbreak and revenge that hit close to home for her growing army of Swifties. At the same time, Taylor was becoming an A-list celebrity. She tried her hand at acting, starring in the star-studded rom-com Valentine's Day, hosting Saturday Night Live, and even portraying a dead teenager on an episode of CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. She also began dating A-list stars like John Mayer and Jake Gyllenhaal, which made her an easy target for the tabloids. As fame and fortune came a knocking, so did her desire to break free from country music's hold on her career. Although she was still winning just about every country music award being handed out, Taylor had her sights set on a new sound that would make her the biggest artist in the world. Taylor Swift began writing music for her fourth album with regular collaborator Nathan Chapman. When Scott Borchetta, head of her label Big Machine, approached her about finishing the album, she told him it was missing something. In a 2012 interview with Yahoo Music, she recalled telling Borchetta that, I think it's good, but I don't think it's different enough, and I don't think we're covering enough new ground here. Usually, Taylor worked either alone or in a closed circle of collaborators, so she had a decision to make. She recalls, My comfort zone is writing songs alone, so I just thought, what if I were to indulge those curiosities that I've always had? Swift immediately thought of someone who could help, so they called Max, as in Max Martin, arguably the most successful pop writer and producer of the past 25 years. Martin had secured massive hits with the likes of Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Casey Perry, and Britney Spears. So naturally, he was the perfect fit for Taylor Swift. Taylor had long admired Martin's ability to elevate a song with his distinctive flair for melody, an almost mathematical approach to finding the right hook. Since I was old enough to understand what a songwriter slash producer is, I've had a curiosity about how Max Martin creates what he creates, she told Yahoo Music. I wanted to see that happen. I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn from him. Taylor got her wish. Along with his protege, Johann Schellback Schuster, Max Martin co-produced three songs for Taylor's new album, and the two would continue to work with her on future recordings. With their help, Taylor was now in a position to redefine herself as an artist, and the first step in this transformation was to come up with a name for her album that can demonstrate how she was feeling. Taylor told Much Music at the time, you know, red is a really bold and intense color, and it's really kind of daring, and I felt like, you know, 
that color and that word really kind of defines the album for me. And, and that's why I can't wait for everyone to hear it. It's, it's something really new. I think, you know, red is so amazing because it's, it can be love or frustration and anger and, or, or like, you know, butterflies and having a crush on someone or like hating your ex. <laughs> Not that I've ever felt that way. Of course, Taylor has never felt that way. Never, ever felt that way. A funny little thing happened to Taylor while she was working on the album. We were in the studio, and I was in the studio with these two amazing writers and producers named uh, Max Martin and Shellback, and they are fantastic. We're in the studio, and we're working on a completely different song. And this guy walks in who was, like, friends with my ex, and at this point we'd broken up, like, an embarrassing amount of times. And so this guy walks in, and he's like, Hey, I'm so-and-so. Never got to meet you before, but I'm friends with so and so. I hear you guys are gonna get back together, and I'm just like, like I'm in the studio with my heroes. I'm like with, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to write a song about something else. I'm like, and and immediately, like after he left, I just looked to Max and I was like, you know, it's weird. It's like we are never getting back together, like ever, 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 ever. We are never getting back together. <laughs> and um, and I just kind of went on this rant, and he's like. We need to write that song, actually, yeah, yeah. like right now. It just happened. Yeah, so if that yeah. dude hadn't walked in, we wouldn't have the song in wow. it. And it's been the, the craziest, fastest rising song I've ever had. Of course, Taylor's never gone on record to say who the guy is that she will never, ever, ever get back together with. But the countless gossip sites on the internet sure seem to think it was Oscar-nominated actor Jake Gyllenhaal. The two dated for three months at the end of 2010. And despite keeping it somewhat private, they were photographed together on a few different occasions. Taylor shared more about the ex she immortalized in the song, telling USA Today, the song, quote, is a definitive portrait of how I felt when I finally stopped caring what my ex thought of me. He made me feel like I wasn't as good or as relevant as these hipster bands he listened to, so I made a song that I knew would absolutely drive him crazy when he heard it on the radio. Not only would it hopefully be played a lot so that he'd have to hear it, but it's the opposite of the kind of music that he was trying to make me feel inferior to. Taylor immortalized this feeling of inferiority on a next single with the lines, and you would hide away and find your peace of mind with some indie record that's much cooler than mine. The funny thing is, if we fast forward eight years and four albums later, Taylor ended up making two cool indie records with members of The National and Bon Iver, and yeah, they were pretty cool. I think it's safe to say that Mr. Gyllenhaal probably had those records on repeat. Who didn't? Taylor premiered We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together during a live chat with fans that was streamed through Google+. Plus. Remember that social media platform? Yeah, no, me neither. Upon its release, Taylor had people grasping for terms to describe her new sound by using new elements like backwards masking effects and synthesizer swells and giving it an unapologetic pop song structure. Critics called it everything from bubblegum pop and pop punk to electro pop and electro folk. And with this new single, Taylor had gone and ditched country music. Well, not entirely. She did release a country version of We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together that was essentially the same song with some banjo on it. But now, all of a sudden, she was a full-fledged pop star defying conventions. Taylor explained to Much Music at the time. For me, um, I just really wanted every single song to sound the way that the feelings felt in my head. So that's kind of like a, like a tightrope to walk on. You just want to get it right emotionally. Like to me, if the song, like if, if what I was feeling felt really frantic and chaotic, that's how I wanted the production to be. You know, so I didn't think of it as much as like, you can't use these instruments, you can only use these instruments. I just wanted to make a record that, that sounded how those emotions felt. The emotions were definitely felt. We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together became a go-to kiss-off anthem for everyone in need of one. With its stomping 4-4 beat, blast-off chorus, and sass-filled dialogue, Taylor flipped the script for sad breakup songs, instead turning in an empowering yet fun sing-along romp. What good would a song this big be without a video that exuded the same kind of energy? When it came to adding visuals to We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, Taylor sought the services of someone she could trust. She brought in Declan Whitebloom, who'd previously directed videos for her songs Mean and Ours. Whitebloom pitched the video treatment as one continuous shot with no edits, which in the end helped him get the gig. He would tell the Film and Digital Times, quote, She's somebody who wants to try something different, wants to be adventurous, and that did it for her. It's a new single. They wanted to make a splash with the video. 
According to Taylor, it took a total of 17 takes to get to the version you see today. She wears five different outfits in the video, which required some lightning fast costume changes to pull it off. She told MTV News, quote, Anytime you see me off screen, I'm ripping one costume off and putting a new one on. All modesty had to go out the window. All my clothes were put together with Velcro and snaps so that I could have three different outfits layered on top of each other. The costume changes were really hectic. We did them in real time. It was crazy. At one point, I had a breaking point. I can't do five costume changes. There's not enough time. But we ended up being able to do it. Luckily for Taylor's band, they only had to wear one costume, furry animal suits. However, when they showed up on set, they weren't told until the very last minute they'd be dressed as critters. All of a sudden, they wheel in their costume rack full of animal costumes, and they were so mad, Taylor told NTV News. It was hilarious. They were so angry. It took a couple hours, but they finally embraced it. It ended up being absolutely hilarious. They are really funny in that video. They owned it. As for the hunky guy that Taylor never, ever wants to get back together with... Well, he's a model slash actor from Toronto named Noah Mills, who currently stars on NCIS Hawaii. But I'm sure even he would say playing Taylor's ex was his finest work. Taylor recreated the video for the song at the 2012 MTV Video Music Awards. And at the end of the performance, she stage dived into the crowd as the camera panned to a different ex-boyfriend of hers, Taylor Lautner. Awkward. But Taylor didn't stop there. She performed the song again at the Grammy Awards, this time with an elaborate circus-like stage design where her ex was tied to a spinning wheel. It didn't make a ton of sense, but one highlight came of it. When she speaks the line, uh, so he calls me up and he's like, I still love you. She used an English accent, which many took as some shade thrown at her most recent breakup at the time, Harry Styles. Way to use one song against multiple ex-boyfriends, Taylor. We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together was a massive hit for Taylor and set her on a new path in her career. It was nominated for Record of the Year at the Grammys and won Top Country Song at the Billboard Music Awards, which is kind of funny since it's not really a country song. Is it? No, it's not. The song even earned an entry into the 2014 edition of the Guinness Book of Records after it became the fastest selling digital single just 50 minutes after its release. But more importantly, it was Taylor's first song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100, both in the US and Canada. Like the rest of the album, Taylor re-recorded the song for the 2021 release of Red, Taylor's version. Some critics claim they could hear subtle differences, like a stronger delivery of we than before, or a little extra venom, maybe, in how she says, trust me. But they were likely trying too hard to find something different. To most, it was just as good as the original. We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together may not be the most streamed or the most viewed song of Taylor's career, but you could make a case for its importance in shaping her legacy. The song elevated her status from country's hottest young star to the most dominant, the most influential singer and songwriter in pop music so far this century. Where would she be now without the success of We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together? Who knows? But the song remains to be an important one. And you know what? It's still a bop. I'm Miles Galloway, and that was the story of Taylor Swift, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, from Encore, an iHeartRadio podcast. Encore is an iHeartRadio Canada podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. Download the iHeartRadio app for more great podcasts just like these.